Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm your host, Austin Belzer, and today I'm interviewing Michelle Asper, a cat person, which comes out this Friday at the IFC Center in New York with Q&As uh, featuring Susanna Fogel, who directed the film, which she's going to be doing those Q&As uh, on the 6th and 7th at the IFC. And then in California, it's also opening this week at the Lemily Royal in West Los Angeles, Lemily Glendale, and Lemily Town Center. They're also happening this week with expansions over, happening over the next month. This is based on the short story by Kristen in The New Yorker of a few years back. It premiered at Sundance 2023. It stars Amelia Jones, Nicholas Braun, Geraldine Swanathan, Hope Davis, and uh, Isab Isabella Rossellini. It's about the horrors of dating and, uh, and getting that 24th century spin on that, on that in this thriller. So welcome, Michelle. I know that was a bit of a spiel, but thanks for hanging tight. So for those who don't know who Michelle, who don't know who Michelle is, she did a couple of years ago, uh, I want to say this is your most recent, was Operation Mincemeat a couple of years ago. Right. Uh, That's true. I did. Yeah, that came out on Netflix. It was really good. Go check that out if you haven't. I'll have a link in the description for that. You also did Masters of Sex and a few other things. So let's get started. First and foremost, this is a, uh, based on the short story in The New Yorker. So how, how did you approach adapting that for the screen? Well, I read the story like everybody did. I think it was in December of 2017 that it came out and went viral. Somebody approached me and said, what would you think of adapting this? And so I read it and like everyone, I was really kind of struck by how visceral it was, how strange it was and how mostly how relatable it was. So, but it, to me, it kind of had a nightmarish quality. And I thought, wow, if I were going to adapt this, I think it would sort of need to be in the horror realm because I think that's a really interesting genre to be able to take societal issues and by slightly exaggerating them, you get to actually look at them more clearly. So that seemed like a good way to go forward. Yeah, and as somebody who has been in the horrors of online dating, I can tell you it's a horror show. It, it, absolutely. <laughs> it's gotten, it, it's certainly gotten incredibly complicated. And I think that's one of the things that Kristen Ropenian's story does so well is just to show the million ways miscommunication and misunderstandings can happen. Yeah, and then I guess for those who haven't read the short story, I'll include a link in the description for those who haven't, how do you think it, it'll be received or rather portrayed by audiences who haven't read the short story? I think in a weird way, it's easier for people who haven't read the short story because they just come to it with no preconceptions because the story was so sort of, well, both beloved and not beloved. A lot of people had very strong feelings about it. So if you have read this story and you had strong feelings about it, you tend to bring that also to watching the movie. And I, I'm all in favor of people who actually haven't seen the, haven't read the story because then they come to it very clean and they just evaluate the movie on its own terms. Yeah, I had a similar experience with Our Friend a few years back. That was based on a short story, which is based on a true story. And I didn't read the, I think it was the Atlantic article about it and so i went in right. clean not knowing it was based on anything and i probably wouldn't have had the same reaction to it that i did if i had read that short story before beforehand yes it colors your experience it's always a problem with any kind of adaptation which is something i've done many many times in my career but i'm usually adapting nonfiction. so yeah yes you have to just you have to take that into account with the audience is bringing to the experience based on what they've already either seen or read. Yeah. And then I guess talking about your previous work, Masters of Sex, things like that, when you were writing the sex scenes and the film, how did you approach the depiction of that? Well, certainly in the story, the, the kind of disastrous sex is part of the a huge part of what the story is all about. 
that these two people have been communicating mostly through their devices. And so they don't really know each other at all. And it's only when they get in the same room and have to interact with one another that they can actually start to have an authentic experience. And so they're both bringing all these preconceptions into this date. And yeah, I mean, look, it was always going to be kind of the most cringeworthy sex scene <laughs> on Earth. Then we decided to lean into that. And I think one of the things that women especially were reacting to so strongly in that in that story that we wanted to continue into the film, which is why women, I think many, many women, and I'm sure many men as well have had that experience. And it's kind of like, how, how do you end up in those situations? And what were the decisions that led to these moments where you think, what am I doing here? And, and why am I here? So that, that is one thing we want to do preserve. It's so brilliant in the story and, but it does mean that you do you have to sit through one of the most challenging sex scenes probably that's been on film lately. Yeah, and it's not entirely unrealistic, you know, at a not entirely similar situation, but I was going on this date to somebody I'd never met. We'd only been talking online. And then we were texting back and forth and we didn't know it, but we were sitting right next to each other, texting each other. And then somebody said, hey, uh, you know, you guys are sitting right next to each other, right? And I'm like, oh, no. But it's just that thing of, you know, you, you have that thing where you're used to not seeing people in front of you. And then you're like, oh, now I've got all this, all, all these th things now that I have to adjust to on the fly instead of waiting for those three little blue bubbles or actually back then the iPhone didn't exist. So it was just a, a flip up phone. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting dynamic, I would say. I would say, I would certainly say our devices make it easier in some ways to find people and it makes it way harder to know them. So, you know, it's up to you to decide whether or not that's an improvement. I think that, I think there's, there's, you know, what we really wanted in that film is to show that it takes actually this sort of disastrous encounter for them to be actually honest with one another. That everything leading up to that was, you know, some form of a, of a false image. Both of them were projecting. Yeah, because there's that uh, of yourself online, um, on social, not social media, but um, on places like Tinder, Bumble, or Hinge, or I could probably go on and on, but where you're trying to create a version of yourself that's most swipeable, I guess, that will attract the person that, oh, I, I want to swipe right on this person because that s sounds like somebody I'd want to go out with. And then you meet with right. them and it, it's a completely different thing because it, it was so curated or even just not, not entirely one-to-one. -one. But with that, I guess, getting into the reflection of how that, of how, how would you think that reflects the experiences of young women today having to curate themselves? into this perfect image uh, of somebody to swipe on. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I think it's, I think it's an enormous, I think it's an enormous burden. And I think especially for young women and men, you know, when you're part of your job of growing up and becoming adult is trying to figure out who you are, this having to always project some kind of idealized version of yourself through social media and all your devices only makes that process more complicated and belabored. And yeah, the idea of putting your phone down and getting away from that for a while is, I think, a good idea. Yeah, for sure. And I guess getting back to, you talked a little bit about the horror elements of this. How did you balance that? horror element with the romantic elements of the story? Well, I never really thought of it as a romance, so I didn't Fair. really feel burned by that. I think that I was trying to 
do is slowly weave a web of two people circling around one another and seeing where that led. So I I didn't I didn't worry so much about quote unquote putting together any kind of a romantic story. What I was trying to do is it's more a, a suspense kind of story, you know, a horror story where you put these elements into place and then you watch them swirl around one another and you want to see sort of how it's going to all eventually come together. And I did want to show moments where they were struggling to kind of reveal themselves and then would pull back. And I wanted to show that struggle and and try and find funny moments in it. Yeah. And but both these characters are really living in their heads, you know, for most of this until they just are forced to confront each other as real people. And yeah, I just didn't feel like, oh, I'm putting together a romantic comedy with a horror. I never felt that. Yeah, that's fair. And then I guess I would be remiss to not mention this, but for those who are in the news, the writer's strike just ended. And I just want to get uh, brief thoughts ab about that really quick. If you don't want to talk about it, that's entirely fine. Just now that you get to promote your work again after months and months of get, not getting a fair deal. Uh, I'm uh, happy that it's over. I, I think we all are. Uh, you know, that was a long strike. I think I feel that it was a necessary strike. There's been many, many changes in our business and yeah, there was just many things that needed to get sorted out and adjusted for this new world that we're living in with this, you know, an, an explosion of streaming and, and everything. And I, I will say one thing about the writer's strike this time around, I've been through three in my life. This one was the most, the membership was on the same page almost entirely. People were supportive. People understood the issues. The guild, the leadership did a remarkable job of keeping everybody informed. So there was a great deal of solidarity in this strike. And that made it much, much easier to bear, I, I think. Uh, not that people didn't suffer. And I always have to say, you know, it's just not the writers that suffer when we go on strike. So uh, I think most of us are very aware, all the people that suffer financially, when something like that happens. But, you know, the, there was just the the way that the financial situation between the companies and the writers uh, was going had to be addressed. It was not going in a good direction. Yeah, especially with the tax write-offs that were happening a lot with streaming and then suddenly like, my work isn't anywhere. Um, uh, yes. Which seems to weirdly be turning around as Disney Plus is putting a lot more stuff on available for purchase for whatever reason i don't know what the economics are there but that was weird i don't um, know that I, I i think very few people know what the economics really are this is part of the reason for the strike so it's it's a very very complicated thing and look at both sides are struggling the companies are trying to figure out what this landscape means and we're trying to figure out how to make a living in this landscape so you know this is what happened and but i think everyone's quite pleased it's over yeah same i'm i, I was really happy to see when i was i think i was looking on my phone i obsessively checked my email and i saw it was over i was like oh thank goodness it uh it, it took so long i'm glad it finally happened and i hope that it happens yeah. um for sag after very soon i know they're meeting today um as we're recording this um i hope they get their fair deal fair deal soon um but yeah um yes with, we, we definitely hope that as well but with that said, I hope people will check out Cat Person. It comes out this week in New York and Los Angeles at previously mentioned IFC Center in New York and the Lemily locations in oh. West Los Angeles, Glendale, and the Lemily Town Center. Uh, it expands over the next month. I'm sure more dates are being added all the time. So go check it out. It's only two hours. I feel like that's a rarity nowadays. So it's it's a nice tight two hours. I fully recommend it. I'll have a review up on the website on October 6th or right before. So go check that out. I hope you all have enjoyed this interview. I've enjoyed 
having you on, Michelle. I hope we get to talk again with whatever your next project is. Uh, Thank you, Onskin. I appreciate it. Yeah, but thanks again, and thanks for everyone listening and watching.